Welcome back to Remote Daily. Today's guest is a brilliant storyteller and explorer, also an executive producer and host of television travel docu-series Fly Brother, currently airing in the United States on public television. And uh, before we bring him to the stage, uh, we have a little something here for you because we want to take a look together into Fly Brother Season 2. Fly Brother with Ernest White II. He produced this show as the founder and CEO of Presidio Pictures. Please welcome with a huge round of applause, Ernest White II. Welcome to Remote Daily, Ernest. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Felix. Uh, it's always a joy hearing you talk about me because you make me seem so empowering, impactful. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. And thanks to the team, uh, you know, Liz, Honest, Jade, Jolie and everybody else for having me as well. You pronounce my name in a very dear, sweet, and kind of German way. Uh, and I, I very much appreciate it. And you, you used to live in Germany, is that right? Yes, I did off and on for about five years. Uh, in, in a former life, uh, I was in and out of Berlin. Many lives uh, for you, Ernest. Where are you today? Uh, you live on the Pacific Northwest in the Vancouver yes. area. Where are you today? Uh, today, I'm in San Francisco, California. Uh, but yes, I do live in Vancouver, BC. I uh, love it there. I'm down here in San Francisco to celebrate many things. The launch events for our, our transformational travel community, Fly Brother and Friends, um, and now the announcement of a few new television projects that we've got coming down the pipeline, and my upcoming 45th birthday. So that's all being celebrated this weekend in San Francisco. Just a few little reasons to celebrate. Well, um, <laughs> let's get some truth out here. Uh, you grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. Your parents were teachers. Uh, they were not worldwide explorers and global citizens like you are. How did you become this? How did you discover that Jacksonville, Florida is great, but you are interested in the world? You want to know what's behind the next mountain? Oh, how did gosh. That I mean, I feel like it was always in me, um, just to, that curiosity. And of course, with my parents being teachers, you know, they would stoke that curiosity. So even though they necessarily hadn't done a lot of uh, traveling, certainly not outside of the U.S., they were very much in favor of all of the kind of um, the, the, the desire for information and culture and, and knowledge and awareness and understanding. Um, and I, I will say this, one of the earliest memories that I have was the German wife of my great grandfather, uh, called her Omi. Uh, and I was like maybe four years old. This was in Jacksonville. And I remember her showing me on a map that, uh, across the ocean from Florida was Africa. And I remember saying that to me and I didn't know what, you know, I didn't get what any of it meant but she was saying not europe africa is across uh the ocean from florida and so even that seed planting that inception um kind of i think sprouted early on and just had me uh seeking to know the world beyond you know jacksonville <laughs> wow shout out to german omi uh yeah. <laughs> i have my omi my kids now have their omi it's it's the way to say it. And my Omi showed me a, p a little piece of the world that I didn't know. She grew up in another country and so did yours. Um, what an amazing image that you for the first time realized there was this, there was this thing to explore just on the <laughs> other side of the ocean. Sure. And now, you know, 30 years forward, um, you have traveled the world. 
you share your experiences, which I think is so powerful. We saw that in the trailer. You do it in a way I have never seen before. Your travel show is different in so many ways to the, I don't know, to the travel shows that we may all have gotten used to over time mm. um, because yours is so focused on the humans that you meet and so little focused on you, you know, on it, mm. you are just a mediator. You're a true host, create, creating a space for the people that you meet. And I love watching it so much. And so do many people. One of them, uh, a good friend actually pointed me towards you and said, look at this, look at this person, look at this show. So when you actually go somewhere, how do you choose what to share and who to meet? Like when you build your show, and you say there's this new place that you have never been to. How do you make sure you convey it to the audience in, in the right way, in the fly brother way? Like what is the, mm -hmm. if there is one, what is the formula that you take when you go to a new place? I think it's just being present and um, kind of leaning into the experiences that are really resonant. Uh, the ones that show up, you know, and, and creating the show is a team effort. Uh, it requires obviously my production team on our side, but also the, um, the destinations that we work with and the people on the ground, be they people that I've been friends with for a long time or new friends. Um, uh, but the energy that kind of shows up when we set the intention to create a, a wonderful, authentic, engaging story always you know, kind of pulls in experiences that we want to share that are, are rife for sharing. Um, and, and that's the thing, you know, it is beautiful to enjoy a place or a space, uh, by yourself, you know, it, it, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but at the same time, like there's just this innate desire that we have as humans to connect and to share the, the experiences that we're having. And so, um, no matter where we go, we end up, um, finding ourselves in situations, be they at a wonderful restaurant or a museum or some kind of cultural experience or in an outdoor experience, a natural experience that just um, is begging to be shared with the audience. And so we, on some level, yes, there's the logistics of, of, of planning everything, but on the other level, things just show up for us. Uh, and that's the, that, that's how we choose things to kind of elucidate in the fly brother style. It, it really is kind of, um, traveling on the fly, if you will, and trusting that wonder will continue to show up endlessly. And it always does. So the name fly brother, as you just mentioned it, you can say it in a more beautiful way that I can fly brother. It has two names in one. And of yeah. course, it has to do with the, the fact that you travel far away. Uh, and but you're also an aviation geek, if yes. I remember correctly. Yes. And then there's the, and then there's the brother part. And I want to I want to touch on that a little bit. When we met for the first time a couple of months back, you were, I, th I believe, the only black host of a travel show on national public television in the US. Is that is that still the case? Or is there uh, now two of you? Well, as far as black producer and host, uh, and certainly if you want to throw in that other uh, identifier, gay as well, as far as I know, I'm still the only one on national broadcast television. Um, wow. Not that I should be, but uh, yes. yeah, there's a, there's a, an importance to that uh, visibility, I believe. Yes, and, and as you just said, you represent two communities that mm -hmm. have been not present in the travel industry um, for, for many different reasons. And you are, um, I think, a figure of identification for both the black community and LGBTQ plus community because of that. Is that when you go somewhere, when you travel, when you produce your show, how much weight does that put on you to be a representation for two communities at once and represent them to your, to your audience, but also to the people that you meet? Well, I think, you know, on one hand, when you're traveling with a crew and you're filming a show, that creates kind of a, a different situation. It creates one of, um, it creates almost a bubble that you're in. And so people see that you're filming, there's um, just this kind of recognition. Ooh, that must be an important person. Even if it's subconscious, people are kind of 
um, more engaging, make room a little bit in a way that uh, might not happen if you don't have cameras trained at you. And so that's the thing I would say my um, demographics seem to come into play more in terms of traveling when I'm traveling by myself. Um, that said, I think it's just being in the space. It's just being out there. And I don't, it's, that's not like I'm running around saying, you know, I'm gay, right? Like that's, it, it, it's just owning the space. If it shows up and, and it comes up, then it does. If it doesn't, that's fine too. Um, but it's being all of me when I'm in the world, be it where I live or, or, or in other places, uh, because people need to see that people need to see someone who looks like me or someone who identifies as me in Tajikistan, in Sweden, in South Africa, in Mississippi and Puerto Rico and, you know, the Adirondacks and, and all of the other wonderful places that we've filmed. And I'm going to uh, screen share your website here for a second, because <laughs> what's really remarkable is when you look at season one of your show, um, you went like out there, you went places that you had lived before, like Sao Paulo, you had to places that, you know, are only now on the map kind of on the, you know, on the edge of travel for Westerners, which is, mm. for example, Georgia, but is now massively um, a popular, you went to, uh, to Africa, just across the coast from Florida, right? You went to Namibia. <laughs> Um, you went, of course, to, to your own home, uh, which is Canada now, and all five continents were, were in there. And then along comes season two, and along comes the pandemic, and along comes the question, what can travel be in a time where travel is not allowed? Mm -hmm. And as you can see here on the screen share, um, you did something remarkable. You connected with the country that you were born in, the United States, and you went all the way from Alaska to Mississippi, to New Jersey, to Puerto Rico, really this empire that is the United States, you went there. And for you, this wasn't just a necessary decision in the pandemic. This was actually a difficult decision, uh, as far as I can remember talking to you, because you never found your home country to be enticing uh, for you as a black man, for you as a gay man, as you just said, you never found it a place that stood out to you and called you as a traveler. How did that change or how do you think about it now in hindsight, looking back at, at season two? Well, I mean, you know, honestly, sociopolitically, uh, the U S has always been fraught for many different communities, uh, from it, throughout it, its entire existence and continues to be so. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say there was no, um, no calling with regard to travel per se, simply because, you know, as a kid, I mean, I wanted to go to New York. I wanted to come to San Francisco. I, I, I there were places I wanted to see and, and, and experiences I wanted to have, but obviously it's your, it's a, your home country. It doesn't have the same sense maybe of, uh, adventure or, um, even exoticness, you know, it, that's something that can be used, um, I guess, uh, in a, a, a problematic way. But when you look at something exotic, meaning something different, something, you know, kind of unknown to you, um, the U S you know, we see it on television. We, 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 we have access to it in, uh, in other parts of the state. So it doesn't, it didn't have that same kind of resonance. Um, and certainly, I guess at a, at a certain point, I uh, worked in politics for a while. Um, I was an educator and, uh, you know, early on, I just got tired of the day to day of trying to have to survive, um, on some level, the every, you know, just even the, the microaggressions. Uh, and so then when I moved abroad, you know, I traded some for others. I traded the ones that I was familiar with, with ones that I was not familiar with and, um, had to learn how to get along in those environments as well. And so looking back after filming a phenomenal season in many different uh, locations, I mean, I, I really uh, was, had a renewed sense of, of uh, joy and um, community going to places and seeing, particularly like in Mississippi, where you had people from, you know, two disparate communities really trying to um, connect, engage, find healing in the traumas of the past and the present. 
and, uh, you know, forge a way forward in which everyone feels seen and empowered and loved. And that was really touching for me. And so, you know, in the face of a lot of um, what I would consider to be problematic uh, policy, uh, you still have that, you know, kind of balance with uh, people who really are trying to figure out, again, a way that everyone can be, um, feel safe uh, in, in the space. And uh, in that regard, you know, many countries around the world are struggling with that. Uh, and the U.S. is still very much a work in progress. And therefore, my relationship to it uh, remains one <laughs> that is at best complicated. <laughs> you said something to us in prepara preparation for this for the session today uh, that I found really remarkable uh, in terms of just a phrase that I want to understand better. The U.S. breeds a lot of brilliance, but doesn't nurture it. Brilliance has to figure it, it out. Uh, therein lies innovation. Just that phrase. Would you mind just explaining sure. to me, but also to everybody else who is just listening, what do you mean by that? Yes. Okay. So I, I, it's funny that you mentioned that because that phrase popped into my mind as I stopped talking to them, <laughs> channeling something I had said in the previous conversation. Uh, but yeah, I do feel like the U.S. It, it breeds innovation, but doesn't nurture it. And sorry, it breeds brilliance, but doesn't nurture brilliance. And therein lies the the you know innovation. It's because um, I mean, you just walk around. There's not a lot of support uh, for families. There's not a lot of support for single women with children. There's not a lot of support for um, really, truly empowering education these days. You're seeing the exact opposite, a draining of uh, funding for projects and programs that kind of help set up people for success. And so when you're in a space where you are brilliant uh, and you have this internal desire to realize that brilliance, to do amazing things, to be of service to yourself and everybody. You know, you have to figure it out when you don't have that kind of institutional or structural support. Um, and that ha the, the, the benefit of that is uh, large scale innovation. Uh, but then on the flip side, if you aren't able to ever really, uh, I guess, figure it out, then you end up lost and crushed under the wheel of um society you know however that ends up showing up uh right now i'm in san francisco you see the large unhoused population that you see in many different cities now as well i'm uh, not you know saying just san francisco not at all but um i mean th th that's pe that that's people who have been kind of crushed under the wheel of society uh they um you know, it, and again, it's, it's, do I want to get, fall into the morass of politics? Not really, but uh, I think it's just important that we acknowledge um, we need societies where we are identifying people's strengths and we are stoking those strengths. We're stoking that brilliance in a way that allows them to innovate from a place of empowerment, not a place of desperation. You know, people are innovating just for survival. Um, that's, Oh, that's a limited kind of innovation. Uh, imagine how much farther we could go when people actually had their needs met. Uh, so, yeah, I'll leave that there. <laughs> well, let's talk about you personally for a second and how you actually got there, where you, where you are today. Because Jolie just put in the chat, I read a news story yesterday about the five most visible cities in the world. San Francisco was number one. Travel is a marketing play. It's very shiny. It looks very different to many sides that you know want a city to see be seen in a, in a, in a certain or place to be seen in a, in, a, in a certain light and then when you actually go there and you experience it through your own lens of 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 society and to be a travel host to many to be the one that actually has the chance to tell the story to shape the narrative is a dream job to many people not so much to you i remember that when you were first offered this opportunity you said no way why was that well, the thing is, number one, I wouldn't even say I was offered an opportunity in the same way that people may think. So let, let's maybe kind of parse what the opportunity was. It. 
Sure. Uh, because it wasn't some, uh, you know, already funded production company saying, we want you to be the host of this travel show that we've put together and we're going to pay you this money to travel around the world. There was none of that. It was, uh, I had my blog, which was uh, talking about international travel from a multicultural perspective, particularly me as a black man, kind of living in Latin America. Uh, I had a lot of like expat uh, information and that kind of thing. And a buddy of mine from college approached me saying, hey, I'm co-owner of a small startup TV network. We want to commission a show from you. We can't pay you, but we can teach you all about advertising and uh, it'll be a non-exclusive agreement. So if you do end up selling the show, then great. But you don't have to worry about us trying to like sink our claws into it. And I was like, definitely not. Uh, I have zero interest in television. I write literature. I am focused right now on my novel. And uh, that <laughs> was, uh, that never happened. The novel never happened. But the TV show did eventually because all of the other doors in my life closed. Uh, and, and until the only thing left to do was to just kind of like say, all right, you know what? Fine. I'll have a go at it. I'll reach out to a few of my contacts in the travel industry. Uh, I had worked as a travel journalist at that point by, uh, for about 15 years and was able to kind of put together the first season with a little bit of seed funding as well. But I had to learn about, and, th and I didn't say no because I didn't want to learn about business. Um, I didn't want to learn about business, but that was not why I said no. I said no because I didn't want to be on television. And that had everything to do with my own issues regarding uh Having been a fat teenager and you know, a lot of self-worth and self-esteem issues, I was hiding behind my writing. Um, and so there was that. And then when I did lean into it, it got hard because I had to learn all about business as, a, as an educator and as a journalist. Uh, and so that was not easy at all. And there were many, many times that I tried to quit. Uh, and so when, <laughs> when we want to talk about dream jobs, I had to build my dream job. I to build my dream. And so I think that's important for people to know. It was not handed to me. It was an opportunity, but uh, it was an opportunity to grow and to expand and to really self-actualize in a way that now when I look back, I am extremely grateful for my ability to run several companies, to do what I want to do. And that's, you know, quite often not easy, but... Uh, it's essential to me now. It's the only way I know how to be is uh, as a creator. And so, yeah, I said no at first to this opportunity, but uh, it, it, uh, it it claimed me. No. <laughs> and not only were you able to pull it off, you had a lot of help uh, in your initial phase from people that gave you money to actually produce it. And as far as I know, the strongest support you've had uh, throughout producing this show came from black women. Oh, yes, definitely. How Always. Uh, just, I mean, uh, you know, women in general on the planet are caretakers of the planet. They're the guardians of the culture. They are, you know, always kind of looking out for uh, their, um, you know, sons and daughters and, 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 you know, like just the extended family, right? I'm generalizing, but uh, I, I find that to be the case. There's always kind of like this loving And particularly it, with uh, Black women in terms of me being a Black man in a space where there aren't many of us, there's always just that desire, you know, oh, baby, like, we want to see you doing well. It's so, like, they have leaned in. And, you know, sometimes it's been $25, sometimes it's been $2,500, you know, but it, it's, it's always been uh, very much a, a, a blessing to have that kind of support from uh from a community in general but very specifically um black women and i have to sing that their praises because of just you know all of the struggles that you know if people in the world face and, and certainly that group of women so uh you know i would not be here uh if it weren't for the black women who were my initial investors my mom who was you know always cheering me on and saying the prayers to keep me out of trouble. <laughs> Omi and mom, shout out Omi to Omi and mama. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, you brought a very big question to the audience today. Um, 
And I think it leads us a little bit into the, the second half of the conversation today mm. about the future and about how our lives are evolving in this time where very a lot of people feel um, uncertainty and anxiety uh, more than anything. You brought like, a, I, and I love that so much, you brought like a really big question um, to the audience. And I'm, I'm just going to say it for you, but I think you can you can say it even more beautifully. Um, so the question for from from uh, Ernest to all of you out there today is, are you doing what you, you truly want to do in life? Uh, Ernest, I'll let you say it again, because then we're going to Hannes is going to give us a few seconds to think about that and type in the chat. Are you doing what you truly want to be doing in life? I love this question because it's hits it hits so many bells in your brain at the same time um and we thank you all for your for your responses here which range from absolutely not to yes um and everything that's in between because as ann says it's ever changing right so so what stands out to you i mean Ernest, first of all why are you even asking that question i have to ask because i feel like there's a lot behind that helps us to understand the answers better Sure, sure. And I, I have to say, I, I love the absolute not, um, just because like the clarity and precision of that, um, that you need that then great because it means, you know, um, where you stand, uh, and that's put you much farther ahead than a lot of other people who just ha do not have clarity at all, but every answer, um, you know, obviously is the right one. And I, I feel like I would say, uh, I'm very close to, um, to Anne's. Uh, kind of understanding of it as being exactly where we're supposed to be. Um, but in that, I also, I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing. Um, that doesn't mean the tasks that I may be up to at the moment are things that I enjoy, but they are very much required for me to be doing the things that I want to be doing on a larger level. And so I asked that question because it was, you know, essentially me asking it of myself. And it was a, uh, a bit of perspective for myself to realize like, this is it. There's no getting to doing, you know, getting to the point where I'm doing what I want to be doing. I'm here, you know, I'm at that point right now. And, um, yeah, again, there may be tasks that are challenging, annoying, you know, all of those things, exhausting, um. Uh, and yet, when I really step back, take a breath, and look at what's being created, I mean, I produce film and television, I tell stories, I travel and meet amazing people and have ridiculous experiences. And um, yeah, sometimes I might have to, you know, do some extra homework in order to like make that you know, uh, uh, keep that afloat or, you know, keep it fueled. I may have to step into fearful conversations, uh, where I'm, you know, raising money or firing somebody, you know, like all of those things are, uh, they're a part and parcel of the beauty of doing what you want to be doing. And, um, so yeah, I forgot what you were asking me, Felix, but uh, that is <laughs> that's kind of why that showed up to me when I was open to what the question of the day would be, is are you doing what you want to be doing? Uh, if, And I think for, for, for people who don't know how to get from no to yes, just the fact that you can say no um, already is the first step. It's just, you know, one foot in front of the other from there. Uh, and, and so, yeah, um, I, I can't remember the gentleman, uh, I believe it was Jose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But like, man, like, dude, you're yeah, for everyone, right, yeah. for, for, for everyone absolutely. who has yeah. the honesty and the, and the, and the guts to write absolutely not, or to think absolutely not as a response to that question. I, I still have like a little bit of an exploding head emoji from everything that you just said. So I'm, I'm still processing this. But what is what is your response to the absolutely not part of the response? Like, what is what is the like you have been there? I think you shared this with us just in the previous response. You have been at the absolutely not. Yes, right? 
I was at the absolutely not when I was doing some of what I'm doing now. That's the craziness. Uh, and that's where, you know, again, the shifting uh, happens because I hated being on television. I hated being looked at, having the camera on me and people staring at me. Um, that, that was not enjoyable at all. Uh, and so if you had asked me in that moment, was I doing what I wanted to be doing? I would have said absolutely not. Um, but when I look back at that, you know, that was all fear. That was all just uh, not being in alignment with what I really did want to be doing. You know, when I think back as a kid and I would just uh, read these, uh, there was a magazine called Plays and it was just all plays. And I would read through the plays and give each, you know, character a voice. I was a natural performer. You know, I was doing that on my own, but as long as no one looked at me. And so, you know, it's just really interesting when you kind of look back at things, the hindsight being 2020, and you see where you were in that moment. And me saying absolutely not was because of fear. So then I um, asked uh, Jose or and anyone else who feels like the answer is absolutely not, or sometimes, or whenever you're not doing what, when you're not feeling like you're doing what you want to be doing, try to consider what the reason is. Is it because of fear? You know, sit with it and just say, like, why am I not doing? It? Is it fear of um, starvation or you know not being able to make your rents? You know, I mean that that's. A lot of people aren't doing what they want to be doing because they need to take, they have, uh, you know, financial obligations that they need to be. That's the majority. Uh, the thing is, what if you were able to have financial abundance doing things that you really want to be doing? You know, how can you envision that life for yourself? Uh, and so I think it's just in the, the recognition that there is the possibility of making money doing what you want to do or being able to do uh, overcoming whatever that fear is. You are someone who was on that journey and then you, where you are now, you realized, I believe, that there's much more to what you do. And a part of it is what you just did. Through travel, you give people a different sense of themselves. And you are now launching with your own show, with your company, into a stage where you say, I can do more. I can do more than share stories from the road and encourage people through showing other people's lives and other cultures and other places. I can help people more specifically. So when we talk about the future of Fly Brother and the future of what you really want to be doing, what is it? What is, what is coming up there and how can we be a part of it? Oh, wow. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Felix, you, you know, one-two punch there. Um, as I would say, with Fly Brother, we, we are all about creating immersive experiences for people. That, that's everything from Fly Brother to um, the projects that we have coming down the pipeline with Presidio Pictures. We want to have people kind of live into the worlds that we create uh, through story. And Fly Brother is, is just that. It's another story. And so in order to kind of not just show uh, what the possibilities are, but to create actual pathways into those possibilities, uh, we've created our, a new membership community called Fly Brother and Friends, uh, in which we essentially um, explore where travel intersects with transformation uh, in the areas uh, of love and relationships and health, wellness, community building, entrepreneurship, location independence, long-term travel, and holistic well-being. These are all areas that I have personally been transformed with travel as a catalyst. You know, travel uh, outside of my home space and outside of the normal and quotidian for me uh, has opened up opportunities in so many different areas of life. And this is what we'd wow. like to be okay. offering other people. I mean, I became an entrepreneur through travel. I became my own boss through travel. I became, you know, a, a global citizen through travel. And, and so we're essentially helping people create um, a global lifestyle and we're inviting people into that opportunity, should I say, um, 
with a co- team of core storytellers who are experts in the field. Uh, one of our storytellers is uh, one of the top matchmakers in the United States, and she can essentially show you how to engage with people from an honest, sincere, authentic place, uh, be it f- in a romantic relationship or a business relationship or whatever. You know, these are all different ways of showing people how to be out in the world. Um, again, health and wellness, fitness and uh, wealth building uh, and, and location independence and long-term travel, remote work, all of those different things. And so um, if you join our community, you're able to, to, you know, you have a space for which you can explore these things. Um, wow. I mean, you're promising. I mean, you're promising a lot. Like it's, it's really like the, for, coming from travel to self-help, right? You're, you're saying, hey, you can be a better self through you know, participating in, in the world that I have created and, and in the network that I'm a part of. What does it mean as, a, as an example, though? Um, and I'll get my camera back running in a second. What does it mean as an example, though, when I join your community? Like, how do you actually help me? Like, who am I going to meet? What is it? What is one, two or three examples for what you're actually going to offer for people to feel better through having, you know, access to your world? Sure. We have virtual courses and workshops, one-on-ones. We have trips that we've curated and uh, some of which I host myself uh, that are themed, including, you know, culinary trips to meditative experiences. Um, Again, we've got our core group of storytellers that uh, create content and uh, offer opportunities for one-on-one coaching, merchandise coming down the pipeline. And it's a a brand new community. We are just getting started. So we're growing slowly and organically, but at the same time, uh, you know, the idea is for all of us to be supportive of one another in creating this global community. Honestly, for me, I want a world in which we are all connected across background and boundary and that when we do go out into the world, we don't feel alone. Uh, And I don't mean to to say it's not great to travel solo because it's phenomenal to do so, but uh, you also want the opportunity to kind of just connect with with like-hearted people. And that's really the world that we're building uh, with Fly Brother and Friends. So as it's, uh, you are currently um, offering a, a special to, to, to sign up. Um, it's a monthly uh, subscription and you're basically giving people the experience of not only, you know, virtually having conversations, meeting people, but actual uh, trips, like experiences that people can take with you and with the people that are part of your, uh, that are part of your network. So a really, yes. a really cool idea. I don't think I've ever heard that from someone who is, you know, in the, in the travel space. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to ask travel is in such a difficult space right now. The future of travel is like running against inflation, against raising energy prices, uh, against climate change. Like there's so much in the travel space alone that needs to be figured out. How are you, how do you make that a part of it? Like, how can you offer a travel community, sustainable travel well i think you know honestly the idea is to make travel sustainable travel where there's not even a a, a difference when you say travel you're automatically thinking sustainably and part of sustainability is uh, um social there's a social component to it there's a, a community component to it it's making sure that you're empowering people on the local level that you're helping people to create wealth and opportunities for um income and, and, and growth and development on the ground with local vendors and, and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, there's also just the exchange of in, information that allows you to travel better, more intelligently, slower, that will let you minimize your carbon footprint simply by being more aware of how you are traveling. And I mean, there's not one easy fix, you know, it's not, a switch that you flip from one day to the next, all of a sudden we're a hundred percent sustainable. It starts with awareness. When I was a kid, there were all of these campaigns on the, on television to get people to recycle. You know, you had to get people into the habit of, of recycling, but first they had to be aware of it. what is recycling, what can be recycled. What does one do when one has, you know, materials that needs, that need to go out. But, and that's where we're, that's what we're doing right now is, 
creating awareness, creating understanding of what sustainability, sustainability even is and how can one engage um, on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, from an empowering standpoint, as opposed to just like, oh, well, you know, the earth's overheating, there's nothing we can do. Not true. Um, but I also don't believe that um, it means we don't have to or, or can't travel either. Uh, I think mm -hmm. there are ways as long as we, we we're here on the planet. That's not for nothing. Uh, you know, if we stop, if, if we were here, great. Okay. The, the, the world just pops back into tip top shape, isn't it? But we are here, you know? And so it's, how do we all coexist even mm -hmm. uh, with and on this incredible planet? There's a link that I wanted to share in the chat here uh, to the, the Sustainable Travel Handbook by Lonely Planet, which is one of the companies uh, that we work with, full disclosure. But they have put a lot of what you just mentioned, the, the local, the being aware of where you actually stay and eat and shop, um, the social aspect together in a, in a handbook to help people to be more aware of that sustainability is not just about emissions, it's about the whole travel experience. Yes. And there's a growing market in that. And the last question I wanted to ask you uh, today, Ernest, is when you look at the future of travel personally, also with your show, where in the world do you see the future of travel happening? Is there a location? Is there a tribe? Is there... Um, maybe a movement where you can point us towards where you say this, I believe, is where I would like to see the future of travel. This is how I can envision it. This is how I this is a part or a place or a community that I want to be a part of because I think they're figuring it out in the right way. Mm. So I, I personally don't feel like there's any one uh, particular community that I would ever feel comfortable being in exclusively. I mean, obviously there's my brother and friends and I want everybody to be a part of that. And it's all, you know, hang out and have fun together. Um, but I also want to be a part of other communities too, because that, that is, you know, that variety is exciting. Uh, and you always want that cross pollination. Uh, and when I say communities, I don't mean necessarily travel communities, just people being themselves in groups. Um, that said, I think the future of travel is internal and external. It's within and without, you know, it is space travel and it is, uh, Virtual transformational travel. and, and it's, you know, retreats, uh, that have going in and meditating and being present and listening and going on, you know, going forest bathing and, uh, all of the different ways in which we're getting in touch with ourselves more and more just as go out into, um, you know, different beyond different frontiers. And also just, um, as we rediscover rural places and the in-between spaces and communities that have often been ignored that are off the beaten path, you know, in a way that is sustainable. So they're not overrun that they are able to receive visitors in a way that is, um, benefiting all parties involved, you know, that's for me, sustainable travel is very much that it's how can we be respectful in a place? Uh, and I think that is the future of travel as well. Just respecting ourselves and the people who are hosting us in their home space. Wow. The future of travel, internal and external. What a beautiful image. Where are you going next? Where's your next ticket taking you to, Ernest? Uh, well, again, I'm here in San Francisco through the weekend, uh, through my birthday, October 31st, Halloween. Uh, and then I'll be <laughs> going back to Vancouver for a few weeks. And uh, right now we are excited about uh, lining up destinations for season three of Fly Brother with Ernest White II. So hopefully we'll be doing some filming as early as December. Uh, and obviously I would love to be getting home to Jacksonville to see my folks uh, over the Christmas holidays, but I am very much open to uh, wherever the wind is blowing me. Uh, that presence has allowed for great expansion and altitude. So uh, yeah, thank you. This is your virtual glitter from all of us for our amazing guest today, uh, Ernest White II, uh, AKA Fly Brother, prepping for season three of the amazing show, the Fly Brother podcast, the Fly Brother community, the Fly Brother 
company, there's so many ways to get in touch with you on social media, um, through your ventures. And it was such an honor to host you today. Have a restful weekend and Ernest, have an amazing birthday. Thanks for being part of the show. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.